Thank you. Uh, this is another 45 minute session. Uh, we would love to keep about 10 minutes of Q&A. As you know, time is starting. Uh, over to Mr. Rishri Borua. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I welcome you all to the day two of the conclave. And with me is a rock star chief minister from a beautiful state of Northeast, Meghalaya. So he is presenting uh, Sri Konrad Sangma, Honorable Chief Minister of Assam. Thank you so much, sir, for making it to Delhi, to be <laughs> making it to Delhi today, sir. Thank you so much. So I'll uh, begin with some uh, legacy politics. So your father, late uh, P.A. Sangma ji, uh, was a great politician and a people's person, I'd rather say and served as the fourth chief minister, then uh, a speaker of the Lok Sabha, held many uh, cabinet ministerial posts. So, uh, in, in fact, uh, fought the presidential election also against Pranam Mukherjee. So my first question to you is, uh, how do you weigh the positives and negatives of having an influential political legacy? Uh, there are, yes, both sides to it. Um, the first side, of course, is that uh, I was uh, into public life at a very young age and uh, exposed to a lot of uh, uh, public life, simple aspects of how to uh, meet people, greet people. So, of course, having somebody like late P.S. Sangma being your mentor and your kind of guide, uh, I think those aspects were very, very positive uh, for me as an individual. Just the smiles that he used to have for the people, the shaking hand, the joking. And of course, uh, from a political thought process also, he is very uh, important because he put in the basic uh, ideas of the beliefs that I have today are in politics especially, are based on his ideas. And third, of course, is that uh, an institutional or an organizational or a political network and a system which he created for many, many years, uh, you know, that is something we were able to take it from that point in time and move it uh, ahead. So that's what, uh, in a nutshell, is the positive side. Uh, but the negative side, of course, I won't say negative, but I guess the pressure, uh, pressure and the expectations uh, are really what uh, are the difficult side you are frequently compared yeah. uh, which is uh, really you know he's like at a different league completely and we are uh, nowhere close to uh, how he was and the different charisma and different qualities he had so that comparison obviously is always there um, which makes it difficult sometimes and uh, yeah, and those challenges will always be there. So it's plus and minus, but I guess uh, we'll have to just take it from both angles and just keep focusing on the work that we have to do and take it forward. Uh, sir, with the majority government in Meghalaya, seven MLAs in uh, Manipur, five each in Arunachal and Nagaland. So NPP is uh, truly a party with a respectable presence across uh, the northeastern states. Unlike uh, some parties who have great history but have become history now, regional parties. So, uh, what is the key strategy behind this expansion? Are you planning to be the next, next Chandra Babu Naidu of India? Uh, number one is that um, there is really not, uh, the strategy is not as important, I think, as uh, the commitment, uh, the hard work, the perseverance, the passion, uh, a lot of uh, parties have got their ideas and their goals uh, and objectives cut out. But it is the continuity that is really important. And uh, in the face of all challenges, difficulties, complications of uh, regional politics, MLAs joining, leaving, people joining, leaving, you know, ups and downs of losing elections, I, what matters more is the, the commitment you showed to moving, moving forward. Uh, again, I come back to late P.S. Sangma. I have seen that commitment uh, in him, and I've learned that 
at least that one bit of quality from him that he had also instilled and taught that we need to continue no matter what the challenge comes in. Once you have decided to work on a path, that path should drive you to move forward and to be committed to what you're doing. And I think that is what is key, number one. Number two, uh, Chandra Babu Naiduji is, uh, is, is a very tall figure. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for him. Uh, the way he had um, started the transformation in then Andhra Pradesh and uh, Hyderabad and the kind of vision he has, and I've seen him speak in many uh, you know, uh, occasions. Number one, it's unfair to compare a, a legend and a person like that uh, to a person you know, uh, of my stature. Number two, it's, uh, I think, important to note that it's not about your personal ambitions. So I would not want to go into that. I think we get things wrong when we start with what is it for me or where do I come or where, how do I achieve that objective or where do I see myself. I think that follows. That follows. What is important is the larger goal. What do we see or where do we see the region of the Northeast? Where do we see Meghalaya? Where do we see the indigenous people? And how do we see Northeast playing a critical role in the growth story of the nation? I think that is what is important. And if our heart and mind is focused on the right objectives, other things will follow. Positions may come, may not come. That is uh, something that is not fully under our control. But I think that's the kind of line I would look at. That it is more about the larger picture and objective of the people, the region, and the country, rather than your own personal uh, goal of saying that I would like to see myself there that day. Okay, sir. Then, uh, with your uh, performance in Meghalaya, Manipur, Arunachal, Nagaland, uh, when do you plan to engage more proactively in uh, taking your party in, in, inside Assam? You have a minimal presence, uh, but the cadre base, there's a lot of hard work that needs to go in. Yes, I totally agree with you. Uh, and uh, we have seen that um, uh, Assam is obviously a much more bigger state, much more complicated state, and uh, many factors are involved in that. And uh, so therefore we need to uh, plan it in a much more better manner. We already have a lot in our hands to uh, to take care of, uh, and of course, I have to uh, run a full state. And uh, the party also, in, in the last six, seven years, we have seen a lot of uh, growth. Uh, so it's not that simple. Uh, we need to see that uh, we can organically move forward. Uh, in politics, timing is very important. So we need to also see the right timing so that we are able to see the correct uh, uh, positioning of different factors that are there and then move in. Uh, for example, as I said, in Manipur, uh, 2017, uh, if you remember and recall, we got four MLAs. I was not chief yeah. minister then. Mm -hmm. I had just taken over the party. And I had res I've got four MLAs. And uh, the uh, UPA block, as to say the Congress block, had roughly 28, yeah. plus minus. And the NDA block had 28. Yeah. And NPP had four. Mm. So wherever NPP went, the government would have been formed. So hence the timing was such that NPP played a very crucial role at that uh, election. In this election in 2022, uh, we got close to 17% of votes and seven MLAs. Right. But we had no role to play in the government formation because of the timing and the yeah. situation yeah. that is yeah. there. So hence all of these factors are important. But yes, to coming to your point, uh, we do intend to move in. And we will see how to move in uh, to uh, cover at least the northeast region because we strongly feel that uh, the presence uh, of uh, the party in the largest state, which is Assam, is also very, very important. Sir, there was a, an alliance coined in 2016 called NEDA, Northeast Democratic Alliance. And that alliance uh, was a greater alliance for cooperation, coordination between the northeastern states. Uh, uh, my question to you, sir, we have very senior leaders like the Nagaland Chief Minister, uh, you are in your second term, and uh, there are other leaders also from the northeastern states. So, and you as a president of NPP, 
has a presence in other northeastern states too. So, have you ever explored the idea of leading NEDA? Uh, in maybe about 15, 20 years back, I don't know if you recall, uh, late P.S. Sangmaji, um, Mr. Chamling, Mr. Zoram Thanga, and Mr. Rio had in fact floated the idea of NEDA. Right. And they had in fact tried to even come together because it is important. It is important for the region. Uh, so it's not an idea that came in just recently. It's yeah. been an idea which has been floating around for a very long time. That among the internal differences and um, maybe uh, objectives and goals of your specific community or state, there is a larger picture of the Northeast which matters. Uh, so that's where the idea came and it's still moving forward. NEDA, of course, formalized it and structured it and gave a connection with the national government. And that is uh, very, very important to really give it shape. Regarding who leads it or who convenes the NEDA, I guess, uh, is not as important uh, personally to me as the impact or the effectiveness of an organization or a platform. And uh, to be very, very frank, I've seen that uh, we have not been able to push the objective of NEDA uh, in the right uh, direction. So yes, we meet once in a while mm. and we give a lot of speeches and everything. But I think it's more important that in critical times, NEDA leaders should meet, uh, should discuss and uh, take the objective of NEDA forward, which is really to represent the people of the Northeast and take up issues of the Northeast which are common to all and in the larger interest of the region. So that has not happened. Who leads is again not important. Again, I come back to my initial point. It's not about the individual it's uh, goal. Picture. It's the larger picture of the organization in the region. Okay. So there was, uh, during the monsoons this time, uh, Guwahati had severe flood issues. And this brings me to a, a, an issue called uh, USTM. Uh, so, University of Science and Technology, which is in Riboy district of Ia State. So, uh, there are many terminologies floated. Uh, maybe true, false, that's not my prerogative to judge it. But I'll just put forward you, it's, it's a part of your state. So, that's why I'm putting forward the questions. So, these are very straight questions. Uh, does USTM have all the required permissions to construct a campus of this magnitude? Yes or no? Absolutely. They have taken all the necessary permissions that need uh, for the construction and the overall setting up of a university of this uh, level. And uh, I must also put on record that uh, US team is doing an excellent job. And uh, they are one of the premier educational institutions of our state. And I've seen the kind of commitment they have shown. Uh, other issues aside, which of course you can debate and, uh, you know, and discuss. But I think at the core of uh, the point being that, are they doing what they're supposed to do? Are they giving the quality education to the students who are there? Is the infrastructure, the research that's taking place, uh, what an education institution is supposed to do, are they doing or not? And it's an absolute yes. They're doing an excellent job, and I must congratulate the entire team. Uh, and uh, also to answer to your question, that all the necessary permissions as per the rules and regulations that are there, uh, whether it's from the deputy commissioner, whether it's from the uh, state government, or whether it's from all any agency, all have been taken. Uh, of course, regarding the uh, issue of uh, uh, any kind of uh, environmental issues that are there, uh, you are aware that education institutions are exempted from that permission. So it's not okay. necessary for them to take that permission, but they have to follow certain norms, regulations yeah, and norms, yeah, okay. which is what they have been very much following. So I just want to clarify that also. Okay. Um, uh, my next question is, if needed, uh, would you defend USTM considering the permissions are in order? I have already defended them. <laughs> no, so uh, it's, it's not about defending anybody. It's not about... Uh, you know, sticking sides or uh, saying that, well, you know, this is right or this is wrong. Uh, you know, it's, it's really about stating facts. Right. That's all it is. Yeah. Uh, I'm here to state facts to you. I'm here to tell you uh, what 
contributions they have made in the past many, many years. And also, I have huge expectations, uh, and I'm very sure and confident that they'll have many, many uh, more contributions in the coming years. Having said that, again, there could be concerns, there could be issues. Yes, they should be looked into. There should be any issues that are there that uh, needs to be improved. Definitely, we can sit down and discuss and then figure out how, you know, if there are concerns that are affecting maybe uh, adjoining areas and all, and if there are certain uh, measures that need to be taken, all of those areas are open for discussion. So I think those are areas which we cannot, like, put in the current situation and say that, oh, you know, what's happening? Mm. Uh, yes, those are discussions that we can have, but the fact of the matter is the permissions that are required and the you know, the procedures have been uh, followed by the university. Okay. Sir, so, uh, coming to another bigger trade from uh, the Minrich Meghale, I heard your dialogues on how the abrupt ban on uh, coal mining affected the state economy. And uh, what is this scientific coal mining that you keep advocating about? And uh, what about the small miners? The new SOP says that you have to have 100 acres of land. And I think you have 85% of small miners rather than only 15% of the big miners who can afford to do a scientific mining and have a 100 acre land. So how do you respond to that, sir? So first uh, and foremost, um, the mining that procedure and the process that used to take place in Meghalaya, uh, these were the traditional miners and practices going on for decades, if not centuries. Uh, and that is how it was happening even before the independence of our nation. 2014, uh, NJT came and said, well, this is not scientific, and they banned it. Before 2014, there was no issue of any scientific or non-scientific. So it's not me who has coined the term. It has been coined by NJT and government of India. But my point is that when it comes to processes like that, it's like what we're seeing today in climate change. You know, uh, so many organizations come in suddenly because of the climate aspect, you know, there's a knee-jerk reaction. And suddenly you just start saying, well, this is not allowed, this is allowed. And for many, many years, uh, you know, things had been going fine. But suddenly you come in and say you ban it. Now, what happened in 2014, if you ask me, uh, very, very frankly, was incorrect. It was not fair at all. Something that you've been doing for 100 years and practicing it and lacks of lives when they're responsible for it. If you find that procedure is wrong, you must give time to correct those measures and procedures and say that, well, look, in five years' time, you're going to stop these things. So please adjust. Yeah. And 10 years' time, these measures will be put in place. So please stop these. And in 15 years' time, it will not be allowed at all. The time frame can change. But what I'm saying is that you need to be giving a justified transition period for a particular activity to come in. And that's what's happening around the world. So what happened in 2014 was unfair. Not only did it affect the, the local people, it affected the revenues of the state. Now, having said that again, uh, we have accepted it. We suffered for five to six years. We went to Supreme Court, we got a, uh, li uh, the ban on the mining lifted, and we approached Government of India based on Supreme Court's orders that you can now apply and you have to go for scientific process. Now the problem with this was, I'm sorry this is a long answer no, no, because it's, okay. it's, a, it's, it's, an, okay. it's an important question. The problem was that in our state, the land and the resources below it belong to the landowner. You see, that's a Supreme Court ruling. And that's the constitutional provision, and Supreme Court has ratified it. So, now when you go and apply for the mining procedures, they have to be specially crafted for Meghalaya, because the land holding systems are different. All those procedures actually were looked into. And while we were going into this complicated network and complicated uh, situation of getting the scientific mining, creating policies and programs to... Uh, and, and, and rules to, uh, to adjust to the conditions and land holding system in Meghalaya, uh, this issue of 100 acres was coming in. Now, for me, I can deal with the 100 acres maybe at the second phase, because if I bring in the 100 acres now and say, well, reduce it to 
five acres or two acres or one acre, then the process starts again from zero. And then again, we discuss. So we were already at you know 10, 11, 12, you know, uh, phase of getting the paperwork done when this issue, uh, you know, kind of came to light because there's so many factors in there and so many organizations, agencies, uh, ministries to to discuss with. So when we were already you know, at a phase where we were closer to getting all our rules and everything um, uh, passed, this issue came up. So we had to take a call whether we will again start from zero and again take another three years or let's at least finish this phase, start a few, and then we again take up this matter with Government of India. So now just to share with you that uh, the scientific processes are not defined by us. They're defined by Government of India, by the coal ministry, by the technical agencies, and the mining ministry. So all those things are involved, IBM and others are involved in India Bureau of Mining. Yeah. Uh, so, so all those agencies are involved. So they define the scientific process. And we are now uh, uh, through with 99% of the procedure. Now the last phase for few of the mines where just the state has to follow certain procedures to give um, you know, the CTE and CTO and give the pollution uh, clearances, only that process is now left. So we are very sure that uh, within a short span of time, uh, you know, we should be able to start at least some of the mines under scientific process. Sir, uh, we have noticed a very systematic branding of Shillong as the, uh, with the music hub of India from uh, filming the Bollywood movie Rock On to then uh, hosting big names from Hollywood and Bollywood like Bran Adams, Akon, Alan Walker in 2024. So what is the idea of uh, marketing Shillong with music? Do you think it's a bubble tourism? It's only limited? No, that is the idea. So it's a bubble? Marketing of... Uh, uh, tourism is an industry which is sensitive in nature. Right. You have to accept that. Uh, if there is COVID, the first industry to suffer was tourism and the last industry to recover was tourism. Um, if you have law and order situation, again the first uh, you know, industry to affect is tourism and the last to recover is tourism. So tourism has always been in that particular part of the chart where you have you know, the most kind of uh, affected uh, sectors. So one cannot be um, you know, looking at I know any strategy and say, well, this is going to be sustainable in the long run. Of course, sustainability factors can uh, change and can change means can be, sorry, can be flexible. Uh, and I totally agree that, um, uh, that uh, when it comes to music, uh, is it the only pillar or only vertical on which we'll push tourism? Uh, absolutely not. There will be many verticals, many foundations, many areas which tourism should push. Music is one of the factors that drives it. So when you drive it, the tourists will come, they will see the music scene. Then we need to ensure that when they come and they are part of the Brian Adams show, then, well, why don't you go to Charapunji? Why don't you go to, you know, the caves? Why don't you go to the waterfalls? So it is about packaging and connecting different sectors and activities with the push of the music sector. Why music is important also is not just because it pulls the crowd. Shillong has a brand name for such music. So we are just using that brand name to our advantage and uh, taking it to another level, you can say. And third and you know, final point being that music is very much in our blood. And we have, uh, uh, you know, everybody loves music in Shillong. So not, and, and Meghalaya is at large. So not just does it, um, you know, invite and bring people from outside, but it also, in a way, gives an opportunity for our local artists, our local musicians to also showcase their talent. And I think that is something that's very important. Sir, uh, uh, when we talk about tourism, uh, what we have seen a larger chunk of uh, tourists visiting Meghalaya, they're confined to Shillong and mostly the police bazaar area and to an extent Cherapunji or Shillong peak side. How do you plan to promote tourism beyond Shillong and Charapunji? Obviously, you are a larger state, you East Kasi Hills, the other side, the Karo Hills. So, we don't see much traction there. Uh, no, in fact, uh, it's not the case at all. Uh, the traction is there. Uh, but it's just that, for us also, Shillong and Charapunji 
happen to be the most visible uh, you know, names there in the market. So therefore, the visibility in the national market and international market is something we use to our advantage. Because when you say Cherapunji, uh, every individual knows that it's the, you know, well, it's not anymore, but it's the wettest place. It was the wettest place, at least when the, you were in school, you were reading. So therefore, we realize that these kind of uh, uh, points that are stuck in the memory of, of people must be used to pull the tourist attention towards Megaland, make it unique, different from others, and then ride on that and then connect it. So therefore, if you look at our strategy now, many, many rural areas are being pushed. Large number of tourists, as soon as they reach Shillong and Chirapunji, they say, Are ab, ab kahan jai? Ab kya kare? And we are ready with the answer for that. I'm not saying we have got everything set up, but we have a master plan in which we are doing that. So whether it is the entire surrounding area and the 50 square kilometers around uh, Cherapunji, around, uh, uh, around Shillong, uh, you know, whether it's the Umiyam Lake or uh, whether it's uh, the Living Root Bridges, whether it's the caves uh, of Meghalaya. We have one of the longest caves in, uh, in India uh, and in fact in Southeast Asia. Uh, so all of these aspects uh, are being developed and you're correct uh, that we cannot just simply leave it to just Shillong and Cherapunji, but that is exactly the strategy that you pull uh, with your USPs, that the unique selling points, and then with this USP, you gain to a hub and spoke model, where then the spokes are the different places which you develop, which is what we're doing now. So uh, currently, all the Northeastern chief ministers, uh, they're in a very sweet spot because all of them are hardcore regional work who uh, regional uh, players also who think for the betterment of the state first they are uh, they want to do something extra for their state so in that context uh, can the northeast chief minister sit together and de derive a logistically convenient yet sustainable tourism circuit which can directly connect maybe Shillong to Kaziranga and uh, maybe uh, Kohima to Aizol and Aizol to back to Kaziranga or to Kohima or to Dimapur. It, it becomes because when anyone visits uh, Northeast, so they have a time frame of a week of holiday maybe. So they land in Guwahati, take uh, one or two days off to Kaziranga, come back to Guwahati, again go to Shillong, do a little touch points here and there, then come back. One week is over. More than the holiday, it becomes very, it's more of traveling involved. Every way, it's two to three hours drive. And for uh, lesser, uh, if we can lessen this time and connect these dots and create a more sustainable circuit, don't you think all the northeastern states can benefit out of it? You have, you have a point, absolutely correct, that uh, that is in fact uh, how in the long run uh, we have to ensure that uh, we package and provide the tourist a uh, complete uh, experience of Northeast. We see ourselves obviously as separate states and having our unique uh, culture and tourism uh, areas of interest. But for a tourist coming in from abroad or coming in from the rest of India, they look at Northeast as Northeast and they would like to see multiple locations. So that thought process, what you've said is absolutely on the right track. Uh, and just to share with you, it's happening. You see, today, if you look at the connectivity between the cities, uh, because of the Uran scheme of government of India, it's already happening. There was a time when uh, we used to travel by bus. Uh, I remember as a young entrepreneur traveling in 2000, 2001, 2002, <coughs> by bus to Imphal, it used to take 20 hours. Yeah. And today it's like 40 minutes uh, of a flight to Imphal, to Dimapur. So this inter-regional connectivity that has happened is already a step towards what you are saying uh, should be done uh, and needs to be done. Where the importance comes in is actually the industry. Uh, and we've been speaking to the industry, the travel agents, you see. They need to package. Now, for example, every state is doing their part. We've been talking to travel agents to tell them that you have to be the, the focal point that, done, that then packages the entire network. 
and then makes that package because it's available now. There are different locations available, there are different flight connectivities available, roads are in a far more better condition, of course a lot of work, work to, be, to be done, but we're far better than what we were before. My point being that somebody has to aggregate this and government necessarily cannot aggregate everything. So the entrepreneurs, the travel agents, they play a very important role in aggregating this and uh, their role should come in. Chief ministers, in fact, you'll be quite surprised and happy to know we talk to each other about this and we tell, you know, like, oh, you're having this particular uh, festival on this date. Okay, I will not overlap it with my festival. Okay. Then we'll have, you know, two days later so that somebody goes to place A for a festival, then they can fly to, you know, our festival so that the connectivity and continuity is there. So we do talk at an unofficial level at, to, to ensure that the festivals don't collide. Sometimes we can't help it because the dates don't match. But we do, at an unofficial level, talk and ensure that we don't, you know, get into each other's space in one way. But I think um, at the end of the day, the larger uh, responsibility lies with the uh, private sector to be able to package it and, uh, you know, and bring all these uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, locations and places together. Uh, because government can do its part, but as I said, the travel agent will play a very crucial role. So your, your idea is great. I will also take a cue from that. I will speak to the uh, chief ministers even more often. We'll have uh, more discussion among the tourism departments. Uh, but as I said, governments can do to a certain level. A right. uh, larger section has to be done by the private sector. So since uh, uh, we are from Assam, I have a question and this is personal also. So uh, people of Meghalaya can buy land in Assam. There's no stopping there then why can't people of Assam buy a piece of real estate in Meghalaya? Yeah, do you think it's fair? A lot of things are not fair in life. Uh, but uh, again, uh, this is something that our forefathers, our, you know, our senior leaders, uh, when they got the statehood, uh, they were very particular. And they had gone for this Land Transfer Act uh, uh, issue. Uh, land Transfer Act, uh, uh, you know, um, the act to be put in there. Uh, at the same time, if you're uh, aware that we are in a six schedule area, in the tribal area, and uh, really it was to protect the tribal, um, you know, identity, it was to protect the tribal land, it was to protect the people uh, more so. And uh, if you ask me, looking back at what was done, this most probably may be one of the best decisions that was made by our leaders then, which has ensured that the identity of the tribals has remained. Uh, the land is, is our major identity in one way. Of course, our dress, you know, our cultures, our festivals are very, very important. But uh, when in the absence of land, uh, and it has been shown in many, many nations, in many states, that uh, the land has been the reason why ultimately the identity of indigenous people has gone. Uh, so, uh, if you ask me, uh, it may not sound fair from the other side, if I may, but uh, when you look at it from our people's point of view, uh, I still maintain that it was one of the most important decisions and, uh, and uh, the, one of the best decisions that were taken, which has ensured that the identity is maintained. It has got its own repercussion and negative side. We have a lot of challenges. Government has challenged. We don't have land. We have to buy land to expand. We are going for Shillong City, the administrative city and the knowledge city now. I have to buy land as a government. So government does not own land. Uh, you know, investments who want to come in. The largest and the first question they ask, Jameen Kai. So we have to then buy industrial areas and then give it to them. But then, I guess nothing is perfect. No, no, no solution or no... Uh, decision you take will have uh, impact that will make everybody happy. But I think if you look back at this decision, as I said, I repeat that it is one of the most important and best decisions that was taken, and I still stand by that decision. Uh, but yes, it's not always fair. Sir, uh, Shillong uh, was the capital of undivided Assam until 72. And now, this poor being the capital, the states are divided, their boundaries. But certain tensions on the boundary disputes uh, is persistent since then till now. I've seen your dialogues with uh, your Assam counterpart, 
where uh, you have identified some 12 critical areas, out of which six are resolved, I presume, and six are critical, who are, which you are in talks with. Uh, do you have a status update which you would like to share from this podium? And how soon can this be resolved? Because there are a lot of lives at stake. There's land. Land is a sentimental value for everyone. Absolutely. Uh, in the last 52 years, since uh, Meghalaya state was formed, uh, before my government, the chief ministers and the chief secretaries had met, that is Assam and Meghalaya chief ministers and chief secretaries, had met 26 plus times. I, I can't remember exactly the no total number, but definitely 25 plus times they had met. In those meetings, there was only one decision that was taken, and that is, we will maintain status quo. Now, we all realize that this is maybe one of the most complicated problems that Assam and Meghalaya have. And we need to, you know, resolve these issues. But it is not easy. But it was this government and, of course, the current government in Assam, we decided that let's give it a try. So for the first time in the history of the, the two states, we are actually giving our best, you know, efforts to resolve a problem which was unresolvable for the last 50 years. And it's not easy. Now, just to show you why it's not so easy, that the areas of differences which were identified was even done before we sat, that is right. Mr. Himantaji and uh, myself, because this report was submitted in 2012. So that report was then accepted that this is now the areas of differences. Uh, whereas still within those areas of differences, there are still differences. But now since those reports were submitted, uh, it's very difficult for me to tweak those because Assam will say, well, that's what you have given. So that's the first challenge in itself. So we had to take a tough call saying that, well, we are freezing this at those 12 areas. The first six locations that we managed to move ahead were relatively simpler. I'm not saying easy, but relatively simpler compared to what we have now. And we have been able to come to some conclusion. Again, I repeat, we will not have a perfect solution, but we should try to move towards the best solution. And that is how we have to look at any problem. And the second phase of the six locations, we are going to start discussions very soon. And uh, we will try our best. But as I said, it's very complicated. I don't know where we're heading. But uh, I can only assure the people of both the states that we will give it our best because we also want this to be resolved one way or the other so that these tensions, these loss of lives that we're having and the fear in which the border people are living and this areas of differences is just not fair. That even after 52 years, they still have to worry whether somebody is going to attack them or yeah. shoot them or they cannot you know, go and uh, uh, you know, work in their paddy field. I think these are things which we need to understand and work towards a solution. So this is my last question to you. Uh, there is a lot of history which uh, stayed back in Shillong, ASME's history, and particularly in the Laban area of Shillong. And uh, there's a sizable Assamese community also who resides there with uh, religious establishments, Namgar, school, etc. So can the government of Meghale consider establishing or restoring some kind of historic nature to remind the people of Assam and Meghale of the undivided Assam, restoring that history and sending a message of brotherhood that we were all together would Absolutely. I don't see any issue uh, in that. In fact, uh, long time back, we had discussed with uh, uh, the chief ministers. We were all sitting together uh, having lunch. And uh, we had started, in fact, with a discussion that we should have one location in somewhere in Guwahati, in Assam, which should act as exactly the cultural meeting point of all Northeast and different states also should have different cultural aspects and historical significance of uh, you know, the culture of other states, the history that we have been through, to remind people and to respect each yeah. other. Uh, I'll just give a small example. We have a location in Shillong called Barik Point. I okay. don't know if you're aware. Mm -hmm. It's right in the center, right next to this, uh, the state central library and to the secretariat. It's a triangular shaped uh, you know, uh, land. And it used to house the PWD office. 
we have decided to make that into a unity park. And uh, I have just hoisted a 120 feet uh, Indian flag out there. And my idea is to make that into a point of cultural, you know, uh, yeah, involvement and cultural focus where exactly the points you're mentioning now, the history of Meghalaya, the cultures of the Northeast, how we were part of Assam at one point in time, what was the cultural significance of that? Not only that, I want every chief minister and every state to send me some artifact or some kind of a painting or some kind of a poem or whatever to put it somewhere in that park which will again signify the importance or give some historical background of that particular state or that particular community. So already this unity park concept is coming up and I can assure you in that park we will have the aspect and small areas because there are old buildings which are heritage buildings, uh, maybe even 100 years old. So we are not destroying them. We are going to renovate those buildings like the secretary's uh, bungalows there. So I'm going to renovate it and make it into a museum. And in that museum, we will talk about the statehood. Yeah. We'll talk about how we were part of Assam, how we got the state, the cultural significance, so on and so forth. So we are already planning what you have just mentioned. Great. So, uh, sir, just one last thing. Uh, before I could get him to the podium, so we were discussing something at, uh, in the holding group. So he mentioned that uh, Bran Adams is coming to Shillong. And... Uh, he said, Ki, I, I'm going to play for him because I have to cut his fees. He's charging way too much. So, uh, I, sir, can we have a trial here, if you can show us? <laughs> Number one, um, again, as I said, uh, 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 I mean, on a joking note, uh, since uh, we were mentioning that, uh, uh, you know, I am uh, uh, also uh, performing. So, I said that, uh, you know, that uh, Brian Adams is going to uh, cut his fees because I'm going to play the guitar for him, which is not true, by the way. It's such a <laughs> joke because uh, sometimes some people take it too seriously. Uh, but on the other hand, if you want me to sing, then yes, yes, uh, we then want you to. have to. You have. I'll have to charge a fees, right? Yeah. So I'll have to. You have to. You have to pay the artist to play. So I'm not. I'm just joking. <laughs> but but I request. Uh, let us let us keep this. Uh, uh, you know, on a serious uh, note uh, on the important issues. I'm very happy with the kind of questions you've asked, the questions you've asked and the kind of uh, importance you've given. I must congratulate the entire uh, team that has made this happen. I think this should happen more often. And I think it's very important that we involve, uh, you know, uh, the mainstream also in one way, I should say. Uh, we should involve our uh, bureaucrats, uh, officials, important uh, people in society from uh, the capital also uh, to be part of these discussions because it sends a very strong message. Sometimes just the communication gap itself uh, creates a problem, but I think these kind of programs allows that connection to happen and really open up many, many opportunities that can come in the future. Right. For the music part, uh, I invite you to Shillong and uh, I would... Uh, uh, ensure that you are there uh, for the Brian Adams concert. And maybe, just maybe, uh, you know, what I'm saying may come true, that I may have to perform. Great, so great. that, I leave it with that. But uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. When, thank you for understanding uh, yeah, that, okay, uh, that uh, I, I prefer not to okay. sing this time. So thank would you, you so like much. to take some questions? Just I'm, I'm happy to take questions yeah, if you have any. Thank you, sir. As usual, we have some questions from the church, mainly from the student community. And I personally have picked up one question, it's extremely good. Niharika Fukon, where, where is Niharika? Yeah, Niharika, that's good, good question. Give her a mic, somebody. Give her a mic. That's, that's Niharika. Can you display the questions also on the screen so that uh, viewers can also understand? Uh, hello, sir. I am Niharika. No, question. Can you? Uh, yes, sir. I am a student at uh, Ambedkar University, Delhi. So, uh, we all know that uh, Meghalaya is known for its uh, peace and harmony. Mostly because of, uh, you know, the matriarchal uh, society, matrilineal society uh, that we all have studied. Uh, so, uh, sir, despite like being such a great epitome uh, of a matrilineal society, a female dominant society. So why women are lagging behind in Meghalaya politics? 
first thing is that uh, it's uh, uh, it's a question, of course, uh, which is very complicated. It's not there's no one answer to this, but uh, we have seen that uh, when it comes to the political uh, participation. Uh, we have seen that women themselves, uh, you know, are not uh, uh, always very keen to come forward in electoral politics. Uh, you know, we try to promote, we try to push, we try to get in people, but it's not always the easiest thing uh, because maybe that's how in a society that structure is there, we find that the, the ladies and the female, uh, maybe the head of the of the, in terms of the matrilineal society, they are the head, but you will see the, the male uh, taking, you know, the more of the decisive kind of decisions uh, or even in the political uh, angle being there as a, as a leader or being the candidate. So it's, it's a natural thing. One cannot uh, just simply look at this aspect and say that, you know, women are lagging behind in politics because it's not about politics in terms of electoral politics alone, I think a lot needs to be looked into the decision making. What drives the system and what drives governance, what drives uh, important aspects of uh, uh, decision making within that village or society and the state as a whole. Uh, and in that, if you look at it, because of our matrilineal system, not saying it's perfect, but because of the matrilineal system, the uh, participation is slightly higher. Uh, simply because of social status that is there. So they do play an important role. For us as a government, for example, we have taken a very important decision that 50% of the posts in, uh, in your VECs, which is the Village Employment Councils, that's the Manrega uh, community, the, uh, the setup, 50% is reserved for women. So, uh, you know, so you will see that about close to 3,000 women are either secretaries or presidents of the village development uh, economic uh, committee, committee. And they play a very important role at the grassroots, uh, you know, uh, political aspect and development programs like Manrega. So, it's, uh, as I said, it's a very complex uh, uh, issue. Uh, try to answer it in whatever way I could in the short period that you've, uh, that you've given to me. But if you ask me, this should be discussed in a much more larger scale as the one single topic. And then we should bring everybody on board because at the end of the day, it is very important. At the end of the day, we need to push. But again, I repeat that one cannot just look at it from uh, electoral politics point of view of counting the MLAs or counting the MDCs or counting the MPs. Uh, politics, as I said, is about a system, a society, a network, and who and which groups play an important role in the decision making and influencing, I think has to be seen uh, in its own totality. Second question from about music, Rifa Sania Barbara. Where is Rifa? Yeah, Rifa. Your English is a millennial English. <laughs> Uh, uh, sorry, I have to write like this for the character limit. Uh, hello, sir. I am Rifa. And my question is, uh, the music culture of uh, Northeast India still remains very underrated with many artists and bands having the potential to go international. So as the CM of a state with such rich folk and rock music culture and also as a musician yourself, what are your plans or reflections in mainstreaming and promoting this rich heritage of Meghalaya or let's say the northeastern states in general? And by the way, I'm a big fan of your uh, guitar solos. <laughs> Good <laughs> Thank question. You. Thank you so much. Uh, with that uh, note, um, if there is any musician here who you know, can strum a few chords and sing a few songs, I think... Uh, your first desire would be that I just wish I could stand here and play for this crowd, you know. Or I wish I could be in uh, India Gate standing there and, uh, you know, the government would allow me to sing, perform. I wish I could take this music talent of mine and make it into a career. And that's the same thought I had when I was like 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. It just started picking up the guitar. This is in Shillong, by the way. Um, so, when that happened, there was nothing. Forget uh, playing somewhere, I mean, we didn't even have a guitar. When I became chief minister in 2018, those memories were still there in my mind that I wish I could play for the crowd. 
And hence, I started a program for our youth called the Meghalaya Grassroots Music Program. Today, we have close to 3,000 artists. And they're just simple musicians. We pay them anything from 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 per performance to play in different tourist spots, cafes, different government programs on a regular basis. And this has now really caught on. So if you go to Shillong, you'll find, you know, just randomly you'll see somebody playing a guitar out there in, in Police Bazaar. That's the grassroot, Meghalaya Grassroot Music Program. So not only are we uh, giving them, uh, you know, an opportunity to sing and to play and to show their talent, we are paying them to do that. Now, what happens because of that? It's just a simple decision. But then, as you said, you know, it brings out the opportunity that is there. And today what's happening, you'll be happy to know that uh, Hard Rock Cafe has tied up with us. And today, because of that, Hard Rock Cafe tying up with us, we have, from the grassroots music program, we are sending artists to the 18 or 20 locations that Hard Rock Cafe has throughout the country, where Meghalaya talent and Meghalaya youngsters are today playing uh, in, in Hard Rock Cafe in, in different parts of the country. I mean, I wish, I wish this was there during my time when I was a, a, a musician then. I would be like thrilled if I could go to Hard Rock Cafe and, uh, and play. Uh, but I, I guess that's what destiny has it. If I maybe, I would have been a rock star and not a politician today. So maybe that's how it was meant to be. But these are just examples of what we are doing. But music is going to be very, very crucial. So my next step for a uh, grassroots music program is to now give the talent a certification. You see? Now, our musicians are good, but they are not certified musicians. They can't read music. They can't write. They can only hear and play. So we want to professionalize the music now. So I want each of these 3,000, 5,000 artists to start doing that. Next level is to promote recording. So I'm putting up uh, under a program that I've started called CM Elevate, which is an entrepreneurship program. I am planning to put up large number of recording studios, which will allow these young artists to come out with their own music and record it. So on and so forth, distribution of music I, uh, instruments at school level, college level. So music is a very important part of a strategy of mine to engage the youth of Meghalaya, because youth energy engagement and directing the energy of the youth in the right direction is critical for my state, for the Northeast, and for the country as a whole, because that's when we can use this energy and potential of our youth in the constructive you know, work for our uh, country. So if you think there is going to be just things will happen, no, it will not. Our youth, I repeat, is our greatest strength and our greatest challenge. We need to invest in our youth, otherwise the youth will become a destructive force. But if we invest in them and direct them in the right direction, they will be the biggest constructive force of our nation. And that is the vision and thought with which we are moving forward. And music is a very important pillar. I have a lot of criticism when it comes to music in my own state. People say, Kya kar rahe ho? what is this? Why are we spending so much money on this? But it's a much bigger objective than just music. It's really about channelizing the energy of our youth. What a brilliant answer. I must be telling you. must be quite happy with it. Because generation like us have moved up with Lou Madhu and Rudy. Anyway, don't go away. And in this evening, we have a high octane performance from Joy and Nekalan in the evening. That's a good one. I will take probably one or two questions. Not much. Uh, Asrafak Choudhury, you have a googly. Where is Asrafak? Yeah. Can you give him the mic, please? Sir, recently there was a dispute between... Assam drivers and the drivers of no, 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 not that question. Astrophor, you have whatever nitty eye question you have. Okay. I will. I have picked up that question. So th that is the second question. So according to nitty eye report, oh, you, can, you can ask. I'll, I'll be happy to reply. So we. We'll no, I think I was more interested about that nitty eye so, question. So it's 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 up to you. No, I I I am I'm okay with any question. You can be comfortable. No, I have not. Let me assure I'm not filtering it. I'm just. Oh. I mean, that's a bigger question for me. Sure. Okay, sir. So, sir, according to Nitya report of 2024, Meghalaya is the poorest state in India just after Jharkhand and Bihar. So, what are your steps to resolve this? And my second question was that uh, the driver dispute between uh, the Meghalaya drivers and the Assam drivers, the Assam number plates, uh, cars were not allowed to enter Meghalaya. So, what are your steps to resolve those things? So, the two questions. Uh, first, um, I will start with the Nitya Yog. Uh, 
You see, governance uh, is a process. A decision you take today not necessarily gives you a result tomorrow. You invest in different policies. You, I mean, of course, it starts with, first of all, identifying where the problem lies. Now, when we say that we are in the bottom of the economic level, that is a result of the problems that we face. The problems could be multiple. It could be infrastructural issues. It could be policy issues. It could be investment in entrepreneurs. It could be the health issues, education, so on and so forth. Once we crack down on what really leads to these kind of results and the outcomes, we need to then define policies, measures, and interventions to then target to improve those things. For example, I was speaking about this a lot, maternal mortality rate. Meghalaya in 2018 had the highest maternal mortality rate. And we used to look at that as a problem. But not realizing or not expressing that that is a result or an outcome of the problem. Now, what are those problems? Problems are like, uh, you know, the health of the mother. The fact that the food and uh, the high-risk aspects. So, in any given uh, time, the approximately about, uh, you know, close to uh, 10,000 mothers out of the 30,000 at any given time, I'm just doing plus minus, are always high risk because of their uh, history, because of the food that they did not eat or the nutrition that they should have got before they were actually uh, pregnant. Uh, then we had a problem because we realized that the spacing between the births was too much, uh, too less. For example, uh, there were some mothers who were 23, 24 years old and giving birth to their fifth child. That means every year they were giving birth and getting pregnant. That's not good for a mother. Then we realized that institutional deliveries are important, but the care that you give them 15, 20 days, 30 days before the institutional delivery is maybe even more critical. And then, so, so what I'm trying to say is that these kind of fine... Uh, Diagnosis of the problem is very critical. Once we started doing this, again, you'll be happy to know, we started improving the overall nutrition for the mothers. Uh, of course, it, it, is, it goes beyond that because we have to start the nutrition uh, even before they get pregnant. So that aspect is going to come at a later stage for us. But even now, while they're pregnant, we're ensuring that the nutrition is improved. Uh, we are ensuring that we have created over 200 safe motherhood homes where all the high-risk mothers are urged to come and stay 15, 20 days before, pregnant, before delivery. And we give them nutritional food, we give them medical care, we give them financial help to come and stay there. We have vehicles to take them to the institutional setup, be the sub-center or PHC, CHC, to drop them. Now, this started in 2019. And today, 2024, we have maternal mortality rate drop by almost 50% in our state. It is the highest that any state has seen uh, you know, in that short period of time. What I'm trying to tell you is, these numbers that you're seeing, I cannot change these numbers in one night. It's a process. And this intervention that I mentioned to you in maternal mortality is one intervention like that there are multiple interventions in multi-sectoral, multi-dimensional ways on all the different, so it's a huge matrix if you come sometimes I'll show it to you. And we know exactly what's happening. Now these investments are showing results. So as I said, uh, you know, we didn't have that kind of a system in place. We didn't have the right diagnosis and we didn't have the capacity to take the, you know, the implementation or action uh, to actually make the difference. I'm very sure that the work that we have done now will start reflecting in the new numbers that will come in. Some of these numbers that are coming in are, are surveys of 2020, 2021, 2022. It's still at that stage when we had just started the interventions. The numbers of uh, what maternal mortality that I'm talking now is 2024, which I have, but the NFS does not have that. So when they come up with their numbers, their numbers are 2021. It looks like I'm trying to give an excuse, but trust me, it's not. You will see that <laughs> Three years, uh, two years later, when the new surveys come up, you will see what I mean when the actual numbers will start reflecting because we already know that the impact is there. The second question which you said about uh, uh, the taxis, uh, it's a natural livelihood issue. I think uh, it's not something that we 
should be too surprised about. Of course, is it correct? Well, it may be not be correct in, in, in its totality. Uh, and should it be resolved? Yes, it should be resolved. Complication is that everybody looks at their livelihood. Everybody would like to see that their livelihood is secured. And everybody would like to see that why are they snatching away our livelihood? So it's a natural feeling that uh, anybody could have. And it's not something that is wrong uh, to have that feeling. But is the measure or the steps that they want us to take, is that justifiable, is the question. So to resolve this issue, uh, it may not be, the solution may not be that we stop vehicles, you know, at the border and people just, you know, uh, have to change the vehicles and taxis. There could be other ways in which, you know, some model of sharing revenue or discussion where we could have some kind of, uh, you know, uh, mechanism to uh, then support each other. Uh, so these kind of areas need to be explored. So it's not so simple, but uh, I'm very clear that uh, solution is not to bifurcate the regions because then both sides lose, which means that when uh, a, a taxi from Meghalaya, Shillong is going, then uh, he or she will be stopped in Banihat, and you cannot drop all the way to the airport. So, well, it'll have a reaction from Assam side also, and if you st stop those vehicles there, then the Assam vehicles also will be stopped in Banihat. And I think it's not healthy for the sector, for the region, for tourism, and uh, I think look, it'll look quite odd for the tourists also to see, ki, ki kya ho rahe? you know, what, what, why am I being asked to get out of my vehicle? So I think there are ways to address it. It requires much more deliberation, and that's the reason I've put up a small committee asking all stakeholders, please give me your suggestions. I want to resolve this, but stopping vehicles may not be the best solution. And if you do want us to do it, be ready for the repercussions. So that's where we are. Uh, it's a process. We hope we'll be able to reach some conclusion but we're working on it. Give us some time. Thank you, sir. That's the uh, end of my queue and a session. Over to Rishi Borwa. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, being here with us. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being a patient audience and the question and answer. Uh, we'll start with the next session in another five minutes. So please stay along with us.